Many people pursuing a life of Torah and mitzvot can sometimes have a feeling that they have grown stale in their walk. Learning becomes a drudgery, following two calendars, the pace of modern day life seeping in and claiming ground. Well, I'm about to talk about a man and his movement that will give you a boost to the brain and to the heart so powerful that by the time I'm finished, your heart will be not only beating again, it will be racing. Sit back as we look at the life of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. When I was in Israel on tour, we pulled up at a set of lights and we saw these guys dancing like their life depended on it. And it slowly dawned on me that there was a joy in the Torah that I might have missed. Who were these guys? And why were they so dang happy? I had to find out more, and I did. So let's start at the beginning, in the town of Metzibish, now modern day Ukraine, where a man came to the world and literally pulled the pin out of the Torah and threw it like it was a hand grenade. <laughs> Rabbi Nachman of Breslov was born in the month of redemption on the 1st of Nisan in 1772 of the Common Era. He grew up in the heartland of Hasidic Judaism and he spent much of his time in Bratslav where he accrued a huge following. And then on to the town of Uman where he would later die and be buried in 1810. So he had somewhat of a short but interesting life. He was the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov and he is one of the most fascinating and unusual Jewish sages that you will ever come across. The founder of a very unique and energetic strand of Hasidic Judaism Rabbi Nachman revived this movement with a left-of-field take on esoteric Judaism and in-depth Torah scholarship, which incorporated a closeness to Hashem that involved a type of secluded meditation and dialogue with the Almighty called Hit Baradut, an act whereby the individual goes out to a solitary location and begins speaking in a loose and open conversation, much like a man speaking with his friend. Also remember to watch Dr. Henry Abramson's lecture on this man, as well as this video. I'll put a link in the description below. This man is the best source of acquainting the layman to Jewish sages in history, and his lecture on Rabbi Nachman is excellent. Unconventional and creative are the words used by Dr. Abramson to describe this man. Despite receiving high criticism in his life and even afterward, the movement that he started continues to grow, and if you've ever seen a Breslov gathering, you will see dancing, singing, and other types of enthusiastic behavior. Even at a set of streetlights, you'll see decorated vans with flashing lights with men dancing, often blowing shofars and playing music, like a spontaneous Torah rave in the middle of traffic, putting smiles on people's faces and joy in their hearts. Rabbi Nachman was inspired by his grandfather, who spent much of his formative years wandering from place to place, relying on Hashem for all his needs. Speaking the vernacular, which was Yiddish, Nachman would tearfully unburden himself before his maker and ask for whatever he needed. As a very young man, he would pay his teacher to give him extra lessons. And throughout his life, 
Rabbi Nachman mastered copious amounts of Talmud and other Jewish literature. He would not only lap up this wisdom for himself, but also enthusiastically encourage his fellow students to do so. More than any other early Hasidic master, the events of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov's life have been recorded carefully in a published work called the Pihulat Zadik, which means Actions of the Righteous, and they provide an invaluable and inspiring glimpse into the life of a man who battled internal and external struggles and blazed a path for others to follow. Associating with simple folk and hiding his piety behind a cloak of erratic actions, Rabbi Nachman was often dismissed by people who took him for a fool or worse. Throughout his life, he had many detractors, including members of his own family and leading Hasidic masters who disapproved of his unconventional ways. In response to his students who complained to him about the bitter oppression they were facing, Rabbi Nachman replied, Trust me, I can make peace with the entire world and no one will disagree with me. But what can I do? There are certain spiritual chambers that can only be accessed through overcoming strife. Citing Moshe Rabbeinu, whose career was dotted with people questioning his ways and trying to instigate rebellion. His time of leadership roughly parallels that of the founder of Chabad, Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, whom he greatly respected, who passed away two years after he did. Yet their paths differed in significant ways. While Rabbi Nachman viewed intellectual achievement as an impediment to overcome, Rabbi Schneer Zalman saw it as a pathway through which one could come close to Hashem. Now here is one of the things that made him unique. Where Rabbi Schneer Zalman wished to elevate the simpleton into a scholar, Rabbi Nachman wanted to teach the scholar to emulate a simpleton. Sounds strange? Well, not really. This path pins a student to humility by acting simply. Notice I am saying simply and not stupidly. He also taught the concept of confessing sin openly and honestly, and as such, some referred to his followers as confessors, known colloquially as viduiniks, from the Hebrew word vidui, which means confession. He would often couch his teachings in stories, many of which since became classics in the Jewish world. He explained that he was doing this because stories had the power to awaken slumbering souls. Telling of princes and paupers, kings and knaves, sinners and saints, the stories contained deep Kabbalistic secrets as well as practical lessons. Thirteen of these epic stories are found in the Sipore Masiot, which contains both the Hebrew and Yiddish texts so that scholars and simpletons alike could access them and their valuable messages. In part due to his many detractors, Rabbi Nachman frequently moved. On his first Shabbat in the town of Breslov, he announced, Today we establish the name Breslov Hasidim, and this name shall remain forever. From now on, our group shall be known by the name of this city, Breslov. At a later point, he explained that the word Breslov is an anagram for Lev Basar, a heart of flesh, with which our heart of stone will one day be replaced in the era of Mashiach, cited in Deuteronomy 10.16 and Ezekiel 36.26. Many Christians and Messianics are very familiar with this concept, probably from Hebrews 8.18 and 2 Corinthians 3.3, and yet have no clue that Judaism has many great teachings on this very concept. Four of Rabbi Nachman's eight children died in infancy, and he lost his wife to tuberculosis before succumbing to the same disease at the age of 38. Though for much of his adult life he was ridiculed and scorned, he has left a legacy of joy that seems to far exceed all other branches of Judaism to this day. This joy coupled with his natural melancholy disposition, giving added perspective to his emphasis on joy being of primal importance. In his own words, he said, struggle with all your might to be only happy at all times, since it is natural to be drawn into depression and sadness. In regard to the act of hit Borudut, Rabbi Nachman taught to establish at least one hour to be alone in a room or in a field and to express in conversation between himself and his maker, including complaints and excuses, apologies and reconciliation, and beg him to lead him to serve him in truth. This conversation should be in the vernacular in which he can best express himself and whatever lies in his heart, both regret for the past and wishes for the future. He should take care to accustom himself to do this every day at a set time, and the rest of the time he should be happy. And this is taken from Likute Ma'aron Tanyana 25. He also selected 10 Psalms to be read in sequence, and he described this as having a wondrous remedy. Psalm 16, 32, 41, 42, 59, 77, 90, 105, 
137 and 150. If one recites this Psalms with Kavana, that is with spiritual concentration, it is a fantastic remedy for the wasting of seed, if said within 24 hours of the act. Someone who recites this sequence daily builds a huge barrier to this sin and other shortcomings as well. In Hebrew, this is called Tikkun Haklali, which means the general remedy or repair. Much of the Likute Maharan is made up of Kabbalistic teachings and interpretations. However, it also contains words that have since become widespread as base lyrics for some popular songs, some of which contain the following. It is a great mitzvah to always be joyous. A man must cross a narrow bridge, and the main thing is not to fear at all. It is forbidden to give up on yourself. And even in hidden places, and even within the hidden within the hidden, certainly God is embedded within that as well. In 1807, when passing through the city of Uman, on his way from Zlatopol, where he had been persecuted, to Breslov, where he was to be welcomed, he stopped off in an old Jewish cemetery. There in front of him stood two mounds, where were buried the Jewish victims of a vicious massacre carried out in 1768 by Ivan Gotha and his mob of Hadamark rebels. Standing between the mounds, Rabbi Nachman said, It is good to lay here. Sure enough, he passed away in Uman and was laid to rest in that exact spot. I thought I would finish with one of Rabbi Nachman's stories. I thought this following story in particular is very good because it encapsulates the practicality of choosing to be joyful despite facing hardship. Enjoy. The Diamond and the Wheat There was once a poor man who earned a living digging clay and selling it. Once, while digging clay, he discovered a precious stone which was obviously worth a great deal. Since he had no idea of its worth, he took it to an expert to tell him its value. The expert answered, There is no one here who will be able to afford such a stone. Go to London, the capital, and there you'll be able to sell it. The man was so poor that he could not afford to make the journey. He sold everything he had and went from house to house, collecting funds for the trip. Finally, he had enough to take him as far as the sea. He then went to board a ship, but he did not have any money. He went to the ship's captain and showed him the jewel. The captain immediately welcomed him aboard the ship with great honor. Assuming he was a very trustworthy person, he gave the poor man a special first-class cabin and treated him like a wealthy person. The poor man's cabin had a view of the sea, and he sat there, constantly looking at the diamond and rejoicing. He was especially particular to do this during his meals, since eating in good spirits is highly beneficial for digestion. Then one day he sat down to eat, with the diamond lying in front of him on the table where he could enjoy it. Sitting there, he dozed off. Meanwhile, the mess boy came and cleared the table, shaking the tablecloth with its crumbs and the diamond into the sea. When he woke up and realized what had happened, he almost went mad with grief. Besides, the captain was a ruthless man who would not hesitate to kill him for his fare. Having no other choice, he continued to act happy as if nothing had happened. The captain would usually speak to him a few hours every day. And on this day, he put himself in good spirits so that the captain was not aware that anything was wrong. The captain said to him, I want to buy a large quantity of wheat and I will be able to sell it in London for a huge profit. But I'm afraid that I will be accused of stealing from the king's treasury. Therefore, I will arrange for the wheat to be brought in your name. I will pay you well for your trouble. The poor man agreed, but as soon as they arrived in London, the captain died. The entire shipload of wheat was in the poor man's name and it was worth many times as much as the diamond. Rabbi Nachman concluded the diamond did not belong to the poor man and the proof is that he did not keep it. The wheat, however, did belong to him and the proof is that he kept it. But he got what he deserved only because he remained happy. In this amazingly mystical yet simple original story totally created anew by Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav.
Hey there, before you go, if YouTube normally isn't your thing, you can check out the content of this channel also on Rumble, a new video platform for the more conservative viewer. Thank you for watching and bye for now.